let's talk about the effects of trauma on the human psyche. This is maybe the most important topic that I've ever covered on the podcast because, in my opinion, it's very hard, if not impossible, to understand what is going on with us as individuals, with other people, and indeed largely in societies, in the whole world, without a understanding of trauma. Robert Scare, a leading traumatologist, now sadly at the end of his life, believes that all human pathology is a result of trauma. In recent years, the term complex PTSD was coined. And what that basically means is that rather than having suffered one trauma, a person has accumulated the effects of several little traumas, or rather the overall effects of an environment that was suboptimal to their development. And while I'm sometimes sceptical of psychiatric diagnoses, I think the term complex PTSD is pretty useful because as a therapist, I've sometimes had people come to me saying, you know, I've got these symptoms or these conditions or these blocks. And I've always been trying to think, like, what did this come from? And I can't think of a particular event. And I've said to them, well, it's not necessarily one event that might precondition you in that way. It could just be the environment, the overall, the general feeling. If there was constantly tension in your house when you're growing up, you adapt to that. If you didn't get the amount of attention that you need, uh, you adapt to that. Whatever the conditions are when you're growing up, you adapt to it. One of the things that's made human beings so successful as a species is our unprecedented ability to adapt to our environment. That's why we're on every continent in the world. The fetus doesn't know what country, what culture it's going to be born into, whether it's going to be born into a violent environment or a peaceful environment, so it's equipped to adapt. How one adapts to their environment can vary from person to person. If the environment at home is really punishing, someone might adapt by becoming really intensely independent very early on and get out of the house as much as possible. Whereas another person might adapt by, well, what they call fawning now, which is becoming really effective at avoiding conflict by sucking up to authority. Those may be preconditioned by other factors. I'm not saying that there is no genetic predispositions or personality dispositions that we have. Obviously, everything is a combination of nature and nurture. But even the term nature and nurture is incomplete because all expression of humanity, of personality, is the expression of genes and environment, right? So there's there's not really a clear distinction between nature and nurture. Everything is the expression of a precondition in conditions, if, if you like. So I'm of the belief that everyone, pretty much, to some degree, if we take the term at face value, is to some degree traumatized or is suffering to some degree from complex PTSD. That might sound like a radical notion, but stick with me through the podcast and see if it makes sense to you by the end of what we're talking about here. One of the reasons for this is, in the early stages of life, the human being is extraordinarily vulnerable. I mean, we are born, we are all born prematurely, technically, because the human head, cranium, because we've got such big brains, is too big to pass through uh, the woman's vagina when the brain's fully developed. So as a consequence of that, we're born early. The evolution has hit a roadblock because our heads have got bigger, but, the, but physically 
a woman's hips can actually become any wider and bigger otherwise you know we just snap they just snap in half so nature has drawn a line for us which in this physical form we can actually exceed and because of that because we're born so helpless many man many mammals can walk within a couple of hours of being born you know they can do most of the things they need to do within weeks or months whereas we really can't so we're extremely vulnerable the brain's still forming and we're vulnerable to trauma because we can't actually meet any of our needs and when you're a baby in your crib the not getting the attention you need or not getting fed in time you know even a few hours or you know god forbid half a day whatever you your needs happen to be is like an eternity to you so we're very vulnerable from that respect there's a a psychologist donald winnicott talked about having a good enough mother the obvious implication being that uh, a good enough mother is probably about the best uh, we, we can hope to get because there is no mother that's sufficiently qualified to perfectly meet all uh, young helpless infants needs Parents aren't omnipotent, they're not uh, omnipresent, they've got their own needs, they've got other concerns and things like that. So they can't always be there in a judicious time to take care of our needs when we're babies. Add to that, we don't exactly go into education systems that are aimed at the flourishing of the whole human being. Whether that's by design, whether that was some kind of conspiracy brought forth from the industrial revolution to turn us into robots, or, you know, people when they created the education system uh, are doing the best they know how to do and there's just inertia set into the system, so reforms are slow to be made. I mean, there's been stuff coming out since the 60s, the book Summerhill, there's Steiner, there's uh, Montessori, there's... What's the other kind of school? Waldorf. I'm sure none of these kinds of schools are perfect, but they have at least in some ways improved upon the education system that's mainstream, and yet their ideas haven't been adopted more wisely. More recently, Alfie Cohn has written book after book after book on education, on evidence-based reforms to the education system, and it's only in the progressive schools that any of these have been taken on and um, so there's inertia in the system and I'm sure even if they did integrate the insights from these thinkers and researchers we still wouldn't have a perfect education system but we at least know how to improve it a lot more than we have the other thing is the human being is just susceptible to trauma being traumatized is essentially a survival defense mechanism. It's designed to protect the organism from dying if a similar experience to the one that traumatized that organism arises. And not only that, but it's not widely understood how to reverse the effects of trauma. I mean, there's really great information on YouTube, such as by Alan Shore, Robert Scare. These are really great popularizers of the neuroscience of trauma and yet they've not really filtered into the mainstream even in psychotherapy the profession that i'm in i i would hazard a guess that most practicing therapists don't have a full understanding of trauma i mean lord knows i i don't have a full understanding of trauma i know enough to share about it i know enough to help my clients with that but uh, I'm not an expert, I'm not a traumatologist. I just have integrated these insights based on my own process of self-healing and then trying to help the people that I work with. So I guess it would make sense at this point to define what is a trauma. Well, Robert Scheer, a leading traumatologist, S-C-A-E-R, definitely check him out on YouTube. Spending five, six hours listening to his interviews and presentations will not be time wasted. It will really put you ahead. He defined uh, trauma as, as any real or perceived threat to a person's life, and that real or perceived is extraordinarily important, 
that is experienced in a state of helplessness. So you can perceive a threat to your life and you might not feel helpless. You might go into your fight response or you might go into your flight response and run away and you may not suffer a trauma. But what can happen is that you feel helpless when you are in this perceived, maybe maybe there's no threat. Maybe what happens is you're sitting at the bus stop after school and it's raining, you've been at football practice and your parent doesn't show up for an hour, an hour and a half and you text them and you don't get through and you're freaking out, right? You could suffer a trauma. Another person, another kid in the same position could go through the exact same experience and they just tap away happily on Facebook or play one of the games on their phone and they don't suffer a trauma. You could get into a serious car accident and not suffer a trauma, whereas someone else could just have a bump and they do suffer a trauma because it's the perception of the organism that counts, not the objective circumstances in which that organism experiences the trigger for the trauma. So it's any real or perceived threat to a person's life that is experienced in a state of helplessness. So what happens when we suffer a trauma is that the brain reacts, but it doesn't unreact. There's some kind of reaction to the state of helplessness, and the brain goes, well, I survived that incident by adopting this strategy. Therefore, this is clearly a winning survival strategy. This is going to allow me to survive. Now, the part of the brain that is influenced by trauma does not care about your quality of life. It cares about the fact that you have life. At any juncture, any choice between your survival and your happiness to this primitive part of your brain, survival will always win. Now this has great explanatory power because it's remarkable how much potential we do have to learn and adapt and change as human beings. And very high functioning people really do do that. They're constantly learning. If they lose their job, they'll find another one. If they lose a partner, they'll find another one. If their skill becomes obsolete, they'll learn a new one. We would all gain <laughs> from being so conscientious. And yet, oftentimes, you meet people who are extremely rigid and inflexible in their personality, their opinions, they don't easily take on new information, they don't easily change their habits, even ones that are clearly dysfunctional or completely irrational. Even if they stand to gain from changing, they can be quite close-minded. They can even not want to hear anything different. Think how it can make them angry. It can trigger them in unreasonably over-the-top ways when you challenge them. You'd think that they were under threat. Well, it could be that the circumstances are reminding their emotional apparatus of a time or times where they really were under threat. Their trauma is being triggered. They can demonstrate the neurology of this process of traumatization, the brain reacting, but then not unreacting in a laboratory on lab mice. What they will do is they give a mouse a mini stroke and on the EEG, its brain lights up like a balloon. Now within 24 hours, the mouse has regrown the blood vessel that was burst. Technically, there should be no damage to the functionality of the brain. However, the mouse can't see or it's lost the control of its front legs. And when you look at the EEG, its brain still lit up like a balloon because the mouse has reacted to the trauma, but the brain's not unreacted to the trauma. How does this manifest in human beings? Well, some ways is if people are, say, quick to temper or quick to aggression, you've heard of the fight, flight or freeze response, right? Very possible. They had a fight response to the trauma and that's created a trigger in them or that has made them have a tendency to be more aggressive and it doesn't necessarily have to be one thing coming back to my statement on complex PTSD it could be a bunch of small things or the overall 
atmosphere and the environment that they grew up in or experienced through a long period of their life as adults, they adapted in this way. That seemed to be the most stra the most effective strategy that they knew to get them through. Other people become extraordinarily passive. Um, if they get into a conflict situation, they feel like they flush, they, they don't know what to do, they just, uh, they don't want to stand up for themselves, they don't want to assert themselves. That could be a freeze response. And then you've heard of the flight response as well, which is when just people are completely avoiding. And some of us have bits of all of these in us. I know I do. I'm mostly prejudiced towards the freeze response. But yeah, I've done a lot of work and that, that's come down a lot. And I, I notice I'm also can be extremely avoidant of certain things. So that I might have some flight in there as well. But in certain circumstances, if people really hit my, my buttons, I don't often get aggressive or lose my temper, especially now. But when I do, yeah, I can be quite harsh with my words. And that's something that I've had to work with. But now you should have a little bit of an idea about why it's so hard for people to change old habits, even if they really want to. It could be that their bad habits or elements of their character are reactions to adverse circumstances, to, to traumas that haven't unreacted. So to return to my point about how this information and how to overcome trauma is not really widely understood in society, what we have in nature is when animals experience a trauma, what they naturally do is they discharge the trauma. There's a great example you can check out on YouTube, type in trauma bear, and what they show is a video of a polar bear running, and they're chasing him in a helicopter about to tranquilize them. And what they do is they shoot it with the tranquilizer, and it's out cold, it's unconscious, but the body knows how to discharge the trauma. And what you see is the polar bear flailing its limbs, absolutely crazy flailing its limbs. What it's doing is completing the action that it was doing before it suffered the trauma, which was it was running and running and running. So it completed that action, it discharged the trauma from its muscles, and therefore there would be no adverse psychological effects of the trauma if that action of releasing the trauma, of discharging the trauma was completed. Once I was at a retreat and I got talking to someone because I gave them some advice on training their dog, and he asked me about an incident where he took the vacuum cleaner to his couch, not realizing that his cat was sleeping under the couch. And the cat got a fright, ran out from under the couch, and ran, literally ran around the walls of the room three, four times, and then shot out the door. Right? That would be another example of that cat fully reacting to the stimulus. He was worried that uh, would this perhaps have an adverse psychological effect on the cat and traumatize it or something like that. And I was like, no, well, in that circumstance, the cat has instantly reacted. She has run around the room. She's discharged the energy from the fright that she got. And she probably is going to walk away from that unharmed psychologically. The possibility of suffering a trauma would be if the cat couldn't get out and experience a state of helplessness, then there would be maybe a possibility that the cat would have suffered a trauma because she hadn't been able to discharge her response to what might have been perceived as a threat to her life. My parents have a cat. It's a rescue cat that's extremely skittish. If someone sneezes or it touches it in a sudden way, it will get up and run out of the room, right? It's been traumatized, but it couldn't discharge the trauma. We don't know what happened to it. We know it was mistreated. Don't know where it came from. But it seems that cat cannot relax. Even when you pet it, it loves being petted, but it can't sit still. He has to keep on getting up and moving around, right? That would be an example, a clear example of an animal that suffered a trauma but wasn't able to discharge the trauma. You can just transpose that to human experience of life. Another experiment they did was they simulated drowning on two groups of rats, mice, I can't remember what it was, it doesn't really matter, and a third was a control group. So they simulated drowning in two groups of mice and they took them out of the water 
and they started to discharge the trauma. And what they did was they poked one group with the back end of pencils with rubbers to stop them from discharging the trauma, to not allow them to do that. And then in the second stage of the experiment, they simulated drowning a second time on all three groups. Now, the interesting thing is the group that was allowed to discharge the trauma after the first simulated drowning actually performed better, recovered better than the control group. They had become more resilient from discharging trauma, whereas the group that wasn't allowed to discharge the trauma just sunk. They didn't even make any attempt to survive in those conditions and that's quite a a big warning to us uh, about the long-term effects of not actually discharging trauma and also maybe an optimistic message that if we actually recover from our traumas we become more resilient it's interesting because see often when people have a panic attack or something like that or they go through something difficult they will actually start to tremor their legs will start shaking or their arms will start shaking and someone well-meaning will say to them it's okay calm down like you don't have to shake it's okay it's okay you know don't don't, don't shake don't shake that is actually biologically wrong what they're trying to do is to discharge the trauma so as well-meaning as you might be calming the person down and not letting them shake is actually repressing their natural mechanism to discharge the trauma and sometimes you'll see when they, people when they get stressed they start to shake or people can't stop fidgeting that is a sign that they've got trauma that they've not discharged even ticks people have seen them uh, go away when people have ticks through trauma therapy and the implementation of trauma release exercises which again you can look up if you want more information I'm going to try and get someone in the show to talk about them exercises designed to provoke the tremoring to provoke the release of trauma and in a controlled way so that people can begin to discharge and so this is really important as to why our understanding of how the biological mechanisms of the discharge of trauma are not really fully understood in the society and if everyone knew this and if everyone was encouraged to discharge their trauma over a period of time we might see a completely different kind of humanity emerge you know people wouldn't have so many blocks they wouldn't be so locked into their ways coming back to what i said about the brain reacting and then but not unreacting. We don't know how many ways our brains haven't unreacted, how stuck in our patterns we are, and no matter how much we try, we just can't seem to change, even though we really want to change, because our brain has decided this way works. It is prioritizing survival over thriving. um, Some of you know I created an online course and personal development called Surviving to Thriving. If you're interested in hearing more about that, you just email me, antony at beyourselfandloveit.com, and I'll tell you about my online course if that's something you think that might benefit you. I called it Surviving to Thriving. Well, trauma traps us in the surviving paradigm. The only animals who don't discharge trauma after experiencing it are, are lab animals, zoo animals, pets, and human beings. Dig that. Lab animals, pets, zoo animals, and human beings. Why? Because they all live in a cage. The first three, <laughs> the first two live in literal cages, and the third ones, well, pets. And pets, well, they're preconditioned by their social environment with us, and we are preconditioned. We are in a cage of sorts, which is society. Society that doesn't understand trauma, doesn't understand that trauma needs to be discharged, and doesn't encourage the discharging of trauma. So that is an important indication that we've got kind of far from nature. We've got far from our nature. And nature has given us a way to overcome our wounds, but we're not in touch enough with our bodies to discharge those wounds. There are several approaches modalities that I think there's reason to believe can be effective. One is trauma release exercises, which I've mentioned before. Two other ones, which we're not going to explore today, but you can do a little bit of research yourself, are somatic experiencing and EMDR. Another is bioenergetics, developed by Alexander Lowen, who was a student of Wilhelm Reich, 
who was a student of Freud. And each of those developed the ideas of their mentor, I think, for the, mostly for the better. Um, I don't agree with all their views, but I really, really believe in Alexander Lone's findings. I really am into forms of work that involve the body, not just the mind. I mean, I'm a talk therapist, but I'm always, always, always bringing my client's attention back to their body. What are you experiencing? Can you put your attention on your emotions? And people get trauma triggers all the time when they're working with me. And I know enough about working with trauma and I've done enough self-healing that I know how to deal with those when they come up and talk them through them and also teach them to become more resourceful in dealing with that. Try and see if you can regulate yourself when you're talking about a incident like this, whatever the triggering incident was, to keep your level of emotion at about 6.8 out of 10. If you're feeling very well resourced, you can allow it to turn up to 7.2 maximum. Anything more than that, you might lose control. Really losing control of yourself in a therapy situation, becoming so overcome with anxiety or fearfulness or anything like that, for a short time might be okay, for a long time really dangerous. You can actually re-traumatize yourself when you're triggered and your emotions completely overwhelm you. So there's a process of helping people tune into their emotions enough so that they can observe them, so they can be with them, so they can talk through them and remove the imprint from their emotional system so that they're actually clearing themselves of the accumulation of emotion, accumulation of the effects of trauma. Uh, I'm actually in India right now where I'm recording, uh, I'm at a yoga retreat, and in the yogic system, they call these impressions samskaras. That's the word in Sanskrit. The Buddhists also use it. The Buddha, of course, uh, came from India. He was a Hindu before he became the Buddha and practiced yoga for many years, mastered asana, which is taking postures, whether you believe there's such a thing as enlightenment or whether he was enlightened or not. So the story goes. And the idea of a samskara, samskara means an impression. And I, I, I love that way of thinking about it. I don't think that in the yogic system they have the understanding of trauma that we do in contemporary Western culture. I think that yoga, the yogic system, does have a lot to offer us in the West and it certainly engages the body, which is something that I like. It does help from another angle, which is you're basically pushing out. Like One thing that can happen as a consequence of trauma is the body itself can react in a domino effect from the brain reacting and not unreacting, so it can become extremely stiff. The muscles can become tight. These are the effects of trauma. So in a way, from another angle, yoga can help because you're actually extending those muscles, which became tight when you took on the trauma and you're putting stretch back into them gradually gradually stretching them out that's maybe why it's so unpleasant because maybe actually when you're stretching out the tight hamstrings or whatever wherever your issue is you're actually also releasing the emotion and it can feel very emotional doing difficult stretches and yoga you know you you, you might not know why it's so hard because it's not just physiologically hard it's quite psychologically challenging for people to have the willpower to stretch out for an hour and a half so there's a lot of stuff going on but they don't have the neuroscience to back it up because it is very recent these findings or at least refindings i'm sure when people lived a more natural life and hunter-gatherer societies, maybe some of this wisdom existed. Maybe we we're still acquainted with it. I don't know. But certainly we, we wouldn't have had the neurological information, the scientific angle. So in my opinion, there has to be a fusion. There has to be a fusion of all this knowledge. We've just come to a point in history where we do live in a global village and we do have the internet and people can get informed and take the best out of all sorts of healing modalities and mix them together. In a science of self-healing, I'm certainly trying to do my part to pave the way for that by putting out what I know. And, you know, sometimes people will come to me and share what they know with me, and that will help me. But I digress. So I've given you, I've mentioned five things I think that can work. Let me go through them again. Trauma release exercises, somatic experiencing, 
EMDR, bioenergetics and yoga. And I do mean to get an expert on the show to talk about each of these modalities. In fact, I want to do a series of shows where I get people on talking about different healing modalities. Uh, Because, you know, the point for me of Be Yourself and Love It podcast is I kind of tire of the fact that so much of self-help is just philosophizing and, and what I call intellectual entertainment. You know, it's uh, feel good and there's nothing wrong with stuff that makes you feel good. But the thing is, when you finish the self-help book, you're like, yeah, that's really uplifting. But then you just go back to the way you were. My intention with my media has always been to offer practical advice. And so... I really want to get into doing a series on healing modalities to let you guys know a little bit about them and see if you want to learn more about any of them. Just like I did a series on how to make small talk, I'm going to go back to that and do more videos. Uh, I've got lots of ideas for series. It would be great to hear some engagement from you guys on what you'd like to hear on the show. I assume you like whatever I put out because it seems whatever I put out you guys listen to but if you've got any feedback anything you'd like to hear about email me at anthony at be yourself and love it.com i don't know if you prefer these solo episodes i don't know if you prefer my interviews i don't know if you prefer me being interviewed on other people's shows but what i like about the show and what i wanted to do with the show was to have a mishmash but also to bring together all of my materials on personal development in one place so people don't need to go all over the internet looking for where they can find my stuff. That's why I'm doing these podcasts also where I'm putting out old material from years ago so that people don't need to look out for me on this show, that show, on my YouTube channel. This show did take a really long time to put together. I've put off editing and completing it for a while because it was a mammoth task and I had some other priorities. Do me a huge favour. You know someone who'd be interested in this. Please just open up Facebook and send it to them in a private message because the bigger the audience for this show is, the more motivated I feel to put the time into prioritising making content for you. I want to talk to myself. I want to talk to the whole world. So if you do me the kindness of sharing this show, then that would allow me to get high profile figures and deliver the best information available to you, my listeners. So help me grow the show and I promise you I will reward you with excellent content. Until next time, be yourself, but don't just be yourself. Be yourself and love it.